Greetings, citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful, creepy little human being. You, welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy we can meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this craziness, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer. And today we're gonna be discussing a man named James Holmes and the Aurora, Colorado, Dark Knight Rises mass movie theater shooting. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure. Please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. And you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you want. They're both brighter scene, but no pressure. So guess what guys, today's video is sponsored by Dossier. And now if you do not know who Dossier is, don't you worry. I'm gonna tell you all about who Dossier is. Dossier is a fragrance company that creates luxury scents but a fraction of luxury prices, where a typical bottle of luxury perfume can cost anywhere from 50 to hundreds of dollars. How dare they? Dossier perfumes cost somewhere between $29 and $49, and they also offer bulk deals, where you, if you buy three or more bottles, you can get up to 25% off and free shipping. I know that that sounds too good to be true, but it's not, it's real. And so is this moment that you're experiencing with this cat. It's all real. Now, I don't know if you heard, I don't know if you heard, but Dossier now also makes candles. And bro, do you know how much I love candles? Do you know how much I love candles? Now, question, do you ever have the feminine urge to have your home and your person smell exactly the same? Or is that just me? That is why today I decided to get a candle and a perfume in the exact same scent because I wanted to um, coordinate with my home as one does. And I went with the scent Powdery Hawthorn, which is inspired by the Tom Ford Metallic A de Parfume, which I've never smelled that, but this smells so great. Well, <laughs> it would be helpful if I took the lid off, huh? It smells so great. And now I can be all cozy, right? Laying down on this couch as one does with my candle lit up all cozy. And then when I want to leave for work, when I want to leave for work, when I have to leave for work, I can spray this on my body and I can take the cozy with me through my perfume. Anyways, Dossier is offering members of the Brat Pack 10% off of their order when they use the code Bratterstein at checkout for a limited time. And the price is already so affordable with the bulk deals and the percentage off and free shipping and all that jazz that I would take advantage because I can't imagine you're gonna get a better deal than the one you're hearing about here. So again, make sure to click the link down below and use the code Bratterstein at checkout for your new favorite fragrance today. And now I just want to say thank you to Dossier for continuing to sponsor this channel because it's super, super dope. And of course, I want to thank you guys for always being so supportive of everything I do because you are all amazing. You rock. Don't ever change. So now that I'm done spreading the good word of Dossier, we can get into this video. Now, this is a case that I've wanted to cover for such a long time. I don't know why I haven't done it yet, honestly. But it's one of those ones that when it was happening, when it was first developing, I was so interested and inve invested and affected by what happened. And it's one of those things that even to this day, I find still pops into my mind and that I'm still affected by it, particularly in my movie going experiences. Like just, okay, when I'm filming this last week, not when you're watching this, when I'm filming this last week, me and my husband went and saw the new Spider-Man. And I felt in that theater, I told my husband that I felt anxious and overwhelmed and a little bit scared and that I wanted to be know where the exits were and be close to the edge. And I always feel that way now when I go to big movie premieres, particularly if it's like Marvel or DC, those midnight showings um, with a packed theater. And it's solely because of this particular tragedy. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this case, it is horrible and it is terrifying. And James Holmes managed to take something that's most supposed to be like a thrilling and fun and safe experience for so many people and turned it into an actual nightmare by committing one of the worst mass shootings in American history. With that said, I'm going to tell you all about that today. And while I do, I'm going to be putting on a full face of makeup, hence the makeup and morbid makeup. Now, if that's not really your thing, that's cool. Thanks for hanging out this long. I hope you find a channel that presents this case in a way you enjoy. But if you're on the fence, you're not sure how you feel, maybe stick around. You could be surprised by how much you like me. And also if you hear rain, I'm going to try to edit it out. It is raining. And, um, I damn Jackie. I don't control the weather. Like, 
With all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of James Holmes and the Aurora, Colorado, Dark Knight Rises mass movie theater shooting. On July 20th, 2012, at the Century 16 movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, there was a showing of a new highly anticipated film, and that was The Dark Knight Rises. The theater was completely packed, and people were very excited to see it. They were in costume. Everybody was having a really good time. I remember seeing this movie in theater during the premiere here in, uh, in Los Angeles. 30 minutes after the movie began, James Holmes entered the theater dressed from head to toe in tactical gear and turned the entire theater into a war zone. Now, before we get into all the specifics of what he did that day, let's first talk a little bit about who James Holmes was leading up to this horrible incident. James Holmes was born December 13th, 1987 in San Diego, California, but he and his family grew up in Oak Hills, California. And this is so crazy to me because I never knew this about this case because Oak Hills is literally, I, I brought it up on a map because I was like, why does that city sound so familiar? And that's because it's literally the city like next door to where I grew up. Like where I grew up is a very small desert area and Oak Hills was just like right over here. We grew up very close to each other around the same time because I'm born in 88, he's born in 87. And I even knew people from Oak Hill. So it's so wild to think of somebody like this coming from this area. I know there's people who do crazy things in all places, but because the case took place in Colorado, I never thought that I'd have like a personal connection to it. Like I did when I started researching this case and realizing that he actually was from my little neck of the desert woods. And I just thought that was crazy, but anyway. He grew up there with one sister and both his parents, his mother being a nurse and his father having some big old brains on him being an actual mathematician and scientist with degrees from Stanford University, for University <laughs> UCLA and UC Berkeley. And not to say his mother wasn't also smart because being a nurse, like that's, you gotta be smart as fuck, but you just hear scientist and mathematician and you're like, whoa, okay, those big old brains. Anyway, they lived in Oak Hills until James was about 12 years old, and that's when the whole family moved back to San Diego, which is about three hours away, if you do not know the area. Growing up, James seemed relatively normal in some ways. He went to a Lutheran church with his family where he was active. He wasn't like a kid who avoided group sports. He did soccer and he did cross country, which I don't really think is a group sport, but when you read the reports, that's what they lumped it. So maybe I don't know enough about cross country, but he did those. He was also into like role-playing games, like Dungeons and Dragons and WoW, which to look at him didn't surprise me even a little bit. And I'm not judging you if you're into that. I'm just saying sometimes, sometimes you can look at somebody and kind of gauge their interest. And James Holmes looked like somebody who would be into Dungeons and Dragons and WoW. And he was also very into like um, superheroes, the Marvel and DC universes, particularly he was a big fan of Batman, which again, I feel like to look at him, you could tell. I'm judging this book by its cover, but that's because I've read the book. Keep that in mind, you know? So I said in those ways, he was considered relatively normal, but there were some, some areas in his life where he was definitely a little more abnormal. James seemed to have his troubles. He suffered from pretty bad depression and would act out as a result of his manic episodes. And it got worse as he got older and he actually started to hallucinate and was scared of his own shadow and disembodied shadows that he believed were there and were a danger to him and his family. And as a result of those mental health issues, James actually attempted to take his own life at the young age of 11, which is so sad because 11's like a baby. But, you know, feel bad for the kid, not for the adult he turns into, I guess. As he got older, in high school, for example, he seemed mostly fine. He was shy, but not a complete loner. He did have friends, and I don't think he had many girlfriends, likely due to his shyness. He graduated from the Westview High School in the Torrey Highlands community of San Diego in 2006. After graduation in 2006, James took an internship at the Salk Institute of Biological Studies in La Jolla, California, which is about 20 minutes away driving from San Diego. And while there, he was assigned to write computer codes for an experiment. And he did pretty well at this. Like academically, he was always pretty good at everything he did, but he didn't make the best impression on his teachers and his fellow classmates. He was seen as he didn't engage. He was kind of a loner. He did. He stuck to himself and he was overall unnotable to those who knew him at that time, which, you know, to be fair is fine. It's fine if you want to be um, 
more antisocial and stick to yourself. Like there, there's no crime in that. A lot of people are that way. It's just when you look at this case as a whole, knowing what he goes on to do, these are little things about him that could have been, you know, signs. After that internship, James went on to enroll in college and he did so at the University of Riverside. And it was during this time that he also got a job as a summer camp counselor in Glendale, uh, California, which is pretty close to actually where I live now. It seems like this guy just kicked it around my neck of the woods before he went to Colorado, truly. And it's weird, I was just thinking about this. I didn't think about it until right this second, but what is it with these murderers getting jobs as camp counselors because freaking Mark David Chapman was also a camp counselor and was really good with kids. And James was said to be good with kids. He was responsible for a group of kids, like seven to 12. And he was said to be good at his job. Nothing notable in the negative was reported about him from the people he knew at the counseling center during this time. <sighs> this baby inside me is stealing all of my oxygen, sir. Sir, during college in 2010, uh, James received his undergraduate degree in neuroscience with the highest honors. He graduated in the top 1% of his class with a 3.9 GPA. So clearly he got his daddy's big old brain. He was also described as, quotes, a very effective group leader and a person who, quote, takes an active role in his education and gr brings a great amount of intellectual and emotional maturity into the classroom. And this quote about him is a huge difference from what we're going to start to hear about him as time went on. Um, it's like a hu it's like looking at two different people, talking about two different people. But in 2012, James's academic achievements, his grades started to suffer. He started to do poorly in school. He started to distance himself and get more closed off and reserved. And he did really poorly on like a comprehensive exam. And after that, soon after that, he actually just dropped out of school altogether. Prior to dropping out of school though, James had met with a like social services person at the student health clinic. And during one of their, their sessions, cause he was taking like little therapy sessions there, he did express that he was suffering from anxiety depression and homicidal thoughts, homicidal tendencies. And though he told this teacher this, that, or counselor or whatever they're called, I don't really know the social services person, though he told them this, this person didn't really think it was an actual threat and so did not report it at the time, which is a bummer considering what he goes on to do. And there's going to be a lot of reports like while we're talking today of people hearing that he was feeling homicidal, not suicidal, homicidal, and people just not taking him seriously and therefore not saying anything, which sucks. But like, I don't know. It's one of those sticky things. I, I, I don't know. I don't know when you believe someone because I know there's always those weird kids in like college and high school that say weird things. And it's like, when are you supposed to like take this person seriously? I don't know. Maybe when they're in a counseling session and say it, maybe that's when you take it seriously, but I don't know. Once James left school, he ended up moving back in with his family for a time and tried to find jobs that his first degree, because remember he had already been to school prior to dropping out of the second school and he had his degree in neuroscience and all that jazz. So he was trying to find jobs within his field, but he found that it was very difficult and demanding and he wasn't really finding work in the field that he had gone to school for. So to supplement his income, he started taking jobs that for somebody like him, just based on what I've been able to like deduce about who he is as a person, these would be jobs that I can imagine he would feel were below him, especially considering how well he, how gifted he was academically and the fact that he had done the whole thing at the Salk Institute. Um, I just feel like this was probably a low point for him where he saw himself as not living up to the potential that he thought he had. But that is also my opinion. He could have been totally fine with it all, but just based on the trajectory his life takes, I can't imagine he did. Things did end up looking up for James a little bit in February of 2011, when he found himself applying for a position in a neuroscience program at the University of Colorado. And apparently this was like a big fucking deal to even be considered um, to be an applicant for something like this. It was a very prestigious, very fancy situation just for like 
the best of the best, and James ended up being one of the few applicants out of the many, many who had applied who was accepted. So this is when James headed off to Colorado, he, and he got an apartment off campus. He chose not to live on campus, and he got an apartment that was close enough that he could ride his bike to and from school when, on any of the days that he had to be there. I don't know if it was a full-time gig, but on the days, this is pointless. He, he rode his bike. <laughs> That's it. While in this program, the other students noted that James was brilliant, for one, but a little odd, very socially awkward, and a tough nut to crack. He wasn't one to really engage or make friends with anyone, even though people did try. He just wasn't receptive to anyone's advances for friendship or other. But despite this, he did actually end up getting a girlfriend somehow during this time, but it, it didn't work out. And after the fact, um, she was talked to and she described him and their relationship as weird. <laughs> she said that he was weird. He was awkward. Um, he just wasn't very romantic or engaging with her. And that he had also talked to her about being homicidal, but she didn't take him seriously. In 2012, when James was 24 years old, that's when the big first notable shift happened in James, in his personality, in his mannerisms, in his just day-to-day -day activities. Apparently around this time, James started hiring sex workers, which is like all fine and cool. Do what you gotta do. No judgment here. But he also started buying thousands and thousands of rounds of ammunition and also several guns. Within one week, James had purchased both a Glock 22 pistol and then a Remington Model 870 shotgun. The very next month, just hours after failing his oral exam at his school, he purchased a Smith & Wesson M&P 15 semi-automatic rifle. And then the following month, he bought a second Glock 22 pistol. So that's four guns now. And all of these weapons were bought legally. In the four months prior to the shooting, he also bought close to 7,000 rounds of ammunition for his new guns, all bought over the internet. And he placed an order for an assault vest, two magazine holders, and a knife. At this time, he also just completely withdrew into himself. Like he was already pretty antisocial, but you could get like an occasional like, hi back or like a smile out of him. And now he was completely 100% disengaged and wouldn't talk to anyone unless he was telling them about wanting to kill people or showing them his new guns. During these months prior to James's attack, he actually was meeting with a mental health professional. I believe it was somebody who worked for the school that he was attending. And he had told this person that he was homicidal. And this person actually did believe him and actually went to the campus police and went to the, um, threat protection team on campus and reported it saying like, he's saying some crazy shit. And so this person um, told the campus police this and made sure that this was on the record. But at that point, they didn't do anything about it. They didn't take it seriously and nothing was done. At the end of the semester, James failed a pretty critical exam. And it was at this point that he realized that like school, though he had been a gifted academic, it just wasn't really for him anymore. And he dropped out. Once he left, the school deactivated he, his key card, which was like standard procedure, even though some people, there were some reports that they may have like deactivated it beforehand because they thought he was sketch, but this hasn't been like substantiated. This is just something people say. And he was officially out of school. And it seemed like this was something that really set him off because school was at least something that sort of tethered him to some sort of routine and reality. But without it, he just sort of floated off into madness. Crazy little balloon floating off into the sky with no one holding its string to make sure it didn't do anything crazy and end up in the ocean. James clearly seemed to have some idea that something was wrong in his mind around this time because he asked a friend of his from school if they had heard of dysphoric mania. And I looked into it and essentially this is where you have depression and mania at the exact same time, symptoms of both, both issues. And this is something that is commonly found now, though it was thought to be um, rare at one point. This is something that's commonly found in people who have been suffering from bipolar disorder. 
And so he clearly had some idea that something was going on inside of his head to even ask this. And the friend that he asked about this, like tried to reach out to him, tried to like be there for him and help him. And he was like, no, 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 stay away from me. I'm crazy, I'm dangerous, you're just gonna get hurt. Around this time, he also just started getting more interested in darker things overall and started to, to freak people out that he interacted with or at least started to rub them the wrong way. And James found himself obsessed with this independent film or at least the trailer for this film um, that was about this vigilante who went all like vigilante, like doing vigilante like things. And this th film was called um, Suffocator of Sins. And James became so interested in this vigilante style killer that he actually like went as far as trying to reach out to the creator to, to speak to him about this trailer. At this time, James also tried to join a gun club he had called and he had left a voicemail for the owner and the owner had called him back to like speak to him, look into him, see if he'd be like a good fit for the club and James didn't answer. So the owner got his voicemail and apparently I could not find what his like outgoing message was, but whatever it was, was disturbing enough and put this guy on alert enough that one, he was not going to allow James to join his gun club, gun club, absolutely fucking not. And two, he told his employees, like, if this guy shows up, don't let him on the grounds and let me know. So something he said, I would love, I would really love to know what that voicemail was that would make someone so freaked out without even speaking to them to like not want to interact with them at all. You know what I mean? Must have been really weird. And if that's the case, then other people in his life would have called his phone at some point and heard this. So I don't know why, again, seems like there was a lot of times this could have been caught and just wasn't, but I don't know. Hindsight is twenty twenty. It really is. Oh man. Oh man. You know, <laughs> I can't do wings on camera, so. And we're back. On July 7th, 2012, James bought a ticket in advance for the midnight premiere showing of the Dark Knight Rises, which was going to be premiering on July 20th, 2012. And he was gonna be seeing it at the theater in Aurora, Colorado, which incidentally, I did not know this at the time, is not very far from where the Columbine shooting actually took place. The day before the shooting on July 19th, 2012, James took a journal that he had been writing in for a, a prolonged period of time and he mailed it to the therapist that he had been seeing. And he then set up his apartment with booby traps, rigging his apartment to explode. He then grabbed all the things he thought he would need for his task ahead. This included body armor, a helmet, a vest, protection for his arms, legs, and hands, and a gas mask. He also grabbed the stockpile of ammunition that he had been collecting for the last several months and the four new guns that he had purchased just for this occasion. Before leaving his apartment that night, he took his, his like stereo system and he put his music on full blast, likely, I think, in my opinion, to get somebody to go over there and complain about the noise, uh, maybe get management to go into the apartment since he would not answer when they knocked. And we find out later that his front door was likely left unlocked also. So it'd be easier for someone to go in and cause the explosion. James then headed to the movie theater and on his way, on his way to commit this crime, he actually did call a mental health crisis hotline and tried to speak to somebody, but somehow the phone call got disconnected and James never called back again. So James arrived at the theater. He, you know, showed his ticket. He got let in and he went and he entered theater nine. And it's funny, not funny, int um, noteworthy that he had actually bought a ticket for theater eight, not theater nine. And we don't know if he intentionally went into the wrong theater or if it just happened to happen that way because both theaters were showing showings of The Dark Knight Rises, just the one that he ended up in was starting, I believe, five minutes later. But either way, he entered theater nine instead of theater eight, and he walked into a packed theater, dude. There were like 400 people in there. If you've ever been to a midnight showing of a Marvel release, you understand. People, a lot of people go. I mean, this isn't Marvel, though. Batman is DC. But if you've ever gone to a premiere of a superhero movie, like, you know. 
that shit is packed. So James walked in, he took his seat at, in the very front row and he sat down and he watched the first 20 minutes of the movie before getting up and letting himself out of the emergency exit at the front right of the theater. Nobody saw him do this. Don't know how, but he, he walked out and he propped the door open so he could get back in. And that's where his car was parked. When he got to his car, he put on all his protective gear, which consisted of black clothes, a gas mask, a load bearing vest, which is different than a bulletproof vest, though I'm not sure how. Please let me know if you know. A ballistic helmet, bullet resistant leggings, a bullet resistant throat protector, a groin protector, and tactical gloves. James grabbed his guns, he grabbed his ammo, and he put in a pair of headphones and put the music on full blast. He then went to grab these canisters of tear gas that he brought with him. And when he went to grab them, he actually dropped one and had to like chase it, um, chase it down to make sure he had everything he needed. Once he had everything in tow and he was ready to go, he headed back into the theater. At 12.39 a.m., James re-entered the theater through the door he left prop open and immediately threw two canisters of tear gas into the audience. At first, a lot of people who were in that theater thought that this was a joke, that this was a publicity stunt being done by the movie theater for the premiere. There were a lot of people in costume. It wasn't like a weird thing. He didn't really stand out. But they soon realized, before they, before they even had a chance to realize that this wasn't what was happening, they were proven to be very wrong. As the tear gas started to invade their throats and their eyes, making it itch and hurt and water, the gunfire started. James just started unloading bullets onto the unsuspecting guests, guests that were having trouble breathing, were having trouble seeing because of the tear gas. He just like fucking went in on all of these people that he did not know. James had brought with him a shotgun, an AR-15, and two 40 caliber handguns, and people panicked. People started trying to run down the aisles to get towards the exits, and as they did, he just opened fire on all of them. Some people ducked and hid behind, behind seats and on the floor to try to escape him, and some people didn't even realize what was happening at first because they couldn't see, and just sat unaware in their seats until they got shot. A bullet even ended up passing through the wall of Theater 9 into Theater 8 and hit three people over on that side, and no one knew what was happening. Um, the fire alarms started to go off because of the smoke, and so it was just a complete madhouse in that theater with the alarms going off and tear gas and bullets flying everywhere and going through walls and hitting other people. And pe some people were able to escape. They were able to get through the, the freaking theater and get to the exits, but of course, not everyone was able to make it out that day. Those who were able to escape the theater and made it out to the parking lot were met by police who were already there. They had gotten the call almost immediately and they arrived within like 90 seconds. And some people were so badly injured that they couldn't even wait for the ambulance to get there. Police were taking people to ambulances in their cruisers. The scene was so crazy that while people were running out of the theater, they were tr trampling people who were laying on the ground trying to to cover themselves from the bullets. But though there was, you know, that intenseness that caused people trampling each other, there were still people who were actually actively putting themselves in danger to grab other people and pull them out of the theater. And they, it, there were so many people hurt that they ended up needing five hospitals plus a makeshift hospital in the parking lot where the attack happened in order to help all these people. And I did read that of the five hospitals, um, where these people were transported, three of them offered to like limit the medical bills that these people were accruing or to waive them all together in lieu of, in, because of the tragedy. James Holmes fired 76 shots that day, injuring between 70 and 82 people, depending on which reporting you read, and claiming 12 lives while he just simply, quote, went on autopilot, feeling no pain, no fear, no joy, simply doing what he had set out to do that day. This massacre is also known as the deadliest shooting in Colorado since the Columbine High School massacre shooting on April 20th, 1999. And it said that it could have been even more deadly because when police searched the theater later, they found over 200 rounds of ammo that were unused and several of the um, magazines for the handguns 
so he didn't use all of the ammo that he brought to use that day. But there, there was evidence that at least one of his guns did jam, so that could be why he stopped. But either way, he did stop without doing as much as he could have done, though he did fucking plenty. And when he was done, he simply just walked out of the theater, walked to his car, and waited for police to arrest him. Again, just like Mark David Chapman. Just like doing the crime and then just waiting casually to be arrested. When police on the scene first approached James at about 12.45 a.m., initially they actually thought that he was a SWAT member because of the way he was dressed. But as he got, as they got closer to him, they realized that he was, in fact, the shooter. Or actually, they thought he was one of the shooters because of how much carnage there was. Police thought initially that there might be multiple shooters, but it was just James. And according to police, James just simply surrendered when they approached him. Like, didn't try to do anything. He didn't try to grab one of his guns. He didn't try to get in the car. He did nothing. He just put up his hands and he's like, okay, let's go. I'm done. That's it. The responding officers found several guns, both inside the theater and inside James's car. And inside his car, they also found a first aid kit and spike strips because apparently when James left the house that day, he wasn't really sure what he was going to do after. He wasn't sure if he was going to run or if he was going to stay, but he brought that stuff just in case he did run. But somewhere along the lines, he just decided against it. The evening after the shooting, a candlelight vigil was held at the location where the shooting took place. And even President Barack Obama had ordered that the flags, like everywhere, I guess, whatever he has the authority to do at the time, would be flown at half mass until July 25th in remembrance of those who lost their lives that day. Once in custody, James did let police know that he had booby-trapped his apartment to explode. Apparently, from what I read, he wanted to make sure that no kids accidentally got hurt because apparently his line is hurting kids, though we will find out soon that there were kids present in that theater and that he did hurt kids that day, but anyway. Anyways, as soon as police and like the bomb squad got there, it was very clear that this place was wild. As soon as you were to open the door, there was a tripwire there to immediately set off an explosion. Inside, there were also numerous grenades and containers filled with napalm and loose bullets. There were also numerous types of accelerants, which included several gallons of gasoline. It was just a ton of explosives, dude. Enough to blow a hole in the world. No, but there was enough to level not only his building, but also the surrounding building. So as a result, there were mass evacuations um, that lasted anywhere from two to six days, depending on which building you were living in at that time. And during that time, when police were talking to neighbors, neighbors did report that at around midnight, the music in James's apartment started bumping and it was going really, really loud. And one neighbor even reported that she had gone to his apartment to complain and knock on the door and that she realized that it seemed like it was unlocked, but that she felt weird and chose not to open the door. Can you imagine being that lady and finding out how close you were to potentially dying and killing everyone in that building? <sighs> she wouldn't have killed them, but you know what I mean? Setting off the bomb that fucking stupid James set up that would have killed everyone in that building. It's, that would be so much information to get. Like, I can't even imagine that. The notebook that James had sent to his doctor before he committed his attack was received after the attacks, obviously. And inside, it had a ton of information. It had a list of pros and cons on the attack at the movie theater and diagrams of the theater. And it also showed why he chose that specific theater at that specific time for the shooting, um, because he knew there would be a lot of people and probably less kids because it was midnight. He chose that particular theater because he thought it would do the most damage because the police response was slower, which is weird because like the police station wasn't very far from that location. So I'm not sure what his thought process was there. I do remember when I first heard about this case, being under the impression that he had the explosives rigged in his apartment so that that would go off and then all the cops would be over there so they wouldn't be at the theater to respond to his shooting. But when I was doing my research, I didn't actually see anything that said that. So I don't know if this is just something that was like spread around or if it's something that I missed during research, but I, I didn't see anything that proved that that was actually true. But I thought maybe that's why he thought response time would be slower, but I'm really not sure what his, he can't get into the brains of these types of people because their brains don't work like normal people's brains do. That's the point. Otherwise they couldn't do these things. You feel me? 
In this notebook, he also talked about why he chose guns over explosives, and it's because he wanted to make sure he didn't accidentally hurt himself because God forbid he do to do that. He also wrote about how he thought about just becoming a serial killer, but one, it was too personal, and two, he'd probably get caught faster, so he couldn't kill as many people. And he also wrote about how he chose the movie theater strategically, because initially he talked about possibly doing a um, airport because of a lot of people, right? There's a lot of people in airports, so you kill a lot of people, but he didn't want a chance doing it there because he didn't want to be ch have the chance of being labeled a terrorist, because terrorism was not the point. He said specifically of terrorism, and I quote, terrorism is not the message. The message is there's no message. Profound, amazing, brilliant, never, never seen before. Lady Gaga meme, him. One officer who was present at like one of the first responders said, that he was not prepared for the carnage that he's seen, that you can do all you can to try to be prepared for a mass shooting. But when you're actually there and you're picking somebody's guts and intestines up and putting them back in their body and then picking them up and running off with them, nothing you can do can prepare for that. James was charged with 116 counts of first degree murder along with attempted murder charges and weapons charges. And this was for the 12 people he murdered and the numerous, numerous people he injured. And I don't understand how the law works and how it got to be 116 first degree murder charges, but either way, that's what he was being charged with. Warner Brothers, the uh, company that distributed The Dark Knight Rises, said um, of the tragedy that they were deeply saddened by the shooting. And it was also reported that they were going to be making a substantial contribution, um, financial contribution to the Colorado's Community First Foundation um, to try to help the victims of the shooting. Uh, Christopher Nolan, who was the film's director, came out and called the event savage and devastating. And Christian Bale, the, the actor who played Batman in the movie, apparently visited some of the families of the victims um, to share his personal condolences with them. And Hans Zimmer, who composed the soundtrack of The Dark Knight Rises, recorded a song entitled Just Aurora, which I listened to. It's all instrumental. And it was written, obviously, um, for the victims of the shooting. And my God, you should listen to it. I listened to it while I was putting together my notes for this case. And I actually sent it to a friend of mine also. I didn't tell her what it was. I was just like, listen to this because it's beautiful because I like instrumental a lot. And it is beautiful and it's dark and it's haunting and it's worth listening to. And you can find it on YouTube if you just search his name and Aurora. James's defense attorneys claim that he was a psychiatric patient prior to the Aurora shooting because um, they were going to be trying to get him off on um, being insane. And the prosecution thought that this was bullshit and they completely disagreed that that he would be considered a mental patient when he would just occasionally call in for therapy and things like that. And apparently the defense offered to make a deal like from the beginning saying that if the death penalty was taken off the table, he would admit he would plead guilty and be given life in prison without parole. But the prosecution was like, absolutely not. We are not interested in this. This is just a ploy that you even think you could get off on this. And we are for sure going after the death penalty because like if anyone deserves it, it's this fucking guy. James did end up entering a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, but actually, okay, no. So what happened was, is when he was supposed to be entering his plea, he wouldn't enter a plea at all. And the, his defense attorneys were saying that they did not have enough time to really like look into his mental health to decide if they wanted to plea not guilty by reason of insanity. So they couldn't enter a plea at that time, but it had already been like several, several, several months. So they had plenty of time to look into this according to the prosecution. So the judge, apparently a judge has the right. If a defendant will not enter their plea, I don't know if this is just Colorado or if this is everywhere, but the judge can enter the plea for them. So the judge did, the judge said, well, it's been enough time. So I'm going to enter your plea and your plea is not guilty. And um, I'm sure the defense wasn't happy, but the judge did tell him, tell them that they could change the plea to not guilty by reason of insanity later, if they were able to prove that he was mentally insane, or if there was some mental um, deficiency found to be present. And that's exactly what happened. They ended up changing the plea to not guilty by reason of insanity. And when the judge um, asked James directly, like, do you understand? Do you have any questions about what's happening? He said, no. And the judge said of James Holmes, and I quote, I find Mr. Holmes understands the effects and consequences of the not guilty by reason of insanity plea. 
He was looking at the advisement and appeared to be following along. So essentially we're, what we were left with at that time was if the jury was to find James not guilty by reason of insanity, he would be placed into a mental health facility where he would stay indefinitely. Um, and the only way he would ever get out is if the doctors had come to believe that his sanity had been restored, but apparently it's very rare for this to happen. Um, and if they were to find him guilty at that point, the prosecution and the defense would have to bring in, you know, their witnesses and present their cases as to why James should either be executed for what he did or just spend life in prison without the possibility of parole. So these were like, this is what the jury was juggling with at the time. During the course of the trial, it came out that James had been thinking about killing people since he was just a teenager. And that the reason he had gone into neuroscience is because he wanted to try to learn as much as he could to try to figure out how to break his, or how to break, how to fix his broken brain. And he also said that he had contemplated just killing himself instead of killing other people. But instead he came up with this life capital plan where essentially for every person he killed, more value would be bestowed upon him and his life. The defense told the jury um, as like a last attempt to try to get him off on the insanity plea that he was going through a psychotic break when he entered theater nine and committed all the murders that he committed and that he was delusional believing that by killing people, he was adding more value to his life and that by just injuring people or leaving them grieving, this added no value to his life at all. And that all of these people were just collateral damage um, for his bigger overall plan to make himself somehow more valuable. A jury of nine women and three men handed down James's verdict. James Holmes received one life term for each person he killed plus 3,318 years for the attempted murder of those he wounded and for rigging his apartment with explosives. He will never be eligible for parole. And this is the sentence he was giving as opposed to being put to death. It is the court's intention that the defendant never set foot in free society again. If there was ever a case that warranted a maximum sentence, this is the case. The defendant does not deserve any sympathy. James's mother, Arlene, was present at the hearings and she did actually make a statement apologizing, um, expressing her grief and condolences towards the families and all the people left emotionally, physically hurt by James and the people who lost those closest to them when he went in there and killed all those people. Um, and he, she said that he was sorry to James, though he never showed any remorse. He never said anything. He just looked blank. She said that due to his schizophrenia and also the medication he's on, it makes it impossible for him to show his emotions, but that he does feel them. And the judge said of the verdict that was handed down, um, to all of the victims that were affected. And I quote, the jury was not able to return the sentencing verdicts you were hoping for. It feels like rejection. It feels like you were asking for something and were rejected. It feels like defeat. Either way you look at it, the defendant is going to die in the custody of, de of the Department of Corrections. Death is certain. The only question is when. James Holmes murdered 12 people that night in Aurora, Colorado. 12 families were shattered and will never be whole. Again, 12 people were erased from this earth that can never be replaced and will never come back. And I want to now tell you a little bit about each of those people, tell you their names and tell you some things that people who love them said about them. Jonathan Blanc was a 26 year old father of two who died shielding his girlfriend from the bullets. And she did end up surviving. He had served for five years in the U S Navy. Jonathan Blanc was married to his high school sweetheart, Chantel, and the two had two children together, his little peanut and his little tank. When she got the news of her husband's murder, she went to her bedroom and began punching holes into her closet. She said, quote, everything started fogging out and they started telling me he was one of the deceased. I was just confused. It felt like a dream. I was distracted because they looked so normal. Alexander Boyk, who went by the nickname AJ, was 18 years old when he died while on a date with his girlfriend. She ended up surviving. He is remembered by his friends and loved ones as a great person whose craziness touched hundreds. AJ's mother said of losing him, and I quote, I am now a single mother of one child. I've lost half of what I was put on this earth to do, to raise children. 
He was one of the two best things I ever did, and my life is half what it was. Jesse Childress was 29 years old when he went out to the movie with friends and was shot and killed. He was an Air Force sergeant. Quote, he was this bright light. If you were having a bad day at work or feeling down, he'd interject that dry humor. He'd inject a little zip and you were just like, ah, I'm back, I'm good. His mother said that she knew. Before knowing he was actually there, she knew he was in that theater, her mother's intuition. So when she got the call that he was there, she wasn't surprised. His father doesn't talk much about him, but he wears Jesse's clothes to remember him. Gordon Cowden was 51 years old and a father of four, and he died shielding his two teenage daughters from bullets, and his daughters were left unharmed. One of his daughters who was present with him said, and I quote, I just miss him being my dad. He was so present in our lives. Growing up, the idea of one of my parents dying never occurred to me because they were so present. I just miss him being in my life. Jessica Gawi was 24 years old and had a movie with a friend named Brent. She had also been involved in another mass shooting and had survived just two months earlier. She grew up in Texas before moving to Denver to try to break into the television market and she was an aspiring sports reporter. Before the movie started, Jessica and her mother were texting about seeing each other the following week. Her mom's last text to her was, and I quote, I need my baby girl. 25 minutes later, her friend Brent called her mother, telling her that he had been shot twice. <sighs> telling her that he had been shot twice and that he tried his best to save her. She could hear screaming in the background. She said, quote, I cry every day. I probably always will. Her family no longer celebrates Thanksgiving. It's too close to Jessica's birthday. Other simple pleasures for the family have also been lost. John Larimer died when he was 27 years old. He was a petty officer third class and served in the Navy like his father and grandfather. He'd been in the service about a year. He died protecting his girlfriend, Julia, from gunfire. He pushed her down and shielded her with his body. John Larimer was the baby of his family, the youngest of five children. Since his death, the family has stopped celebrating Christmas and other holidays. It's just too sad to think about who's missing. And they used to take family photos a couple times a year, but no more. Quote, I don't think we'll ever do a family picture again, because every time you look at the picture, who's missing jumps out at you. It's like a hole. It's an emptiness. Matt McQuinn was 27 years old and died trying to provide cover for his girlfriend. She survived. His mother, his mother talks about going in and identifying his body. And she says, and I quote, I went in and he was there and it was my son. I asked if he suffered and they said he was shot in the neck and that it was probably within seconds. I told him that I loved him, that I was proud of him because he saved Samantha's life and that we would take care of Samantha. Michaela Medic was 23 years old and she went by the nickname Kayla and she was out with a group of friends when she was shot and killed. Kayla's sister says that she stopped going to the movie theaters after her sister died. She just can't deal with it and is an emotional wreck. She said of her sister, and I quote, she never fell in love. She never got to have a family. She had big plans and she never got to do that. Veronica Moser Sullivan was the youngest of those killed that day and she was just six years old. She had just learned how to swim because she was an actual baby. She died while at the movies with her pregnant mother and her cousin. Ashley Moser, who was Veronica's mother, was critically injured in the shooting and suffered a miscarriage a week after the attack. Ashley Moser said of losing her daughter and newborn baby, and I quote, I don't know who I am anymore. I was a mom when I was 18, and that's all I knew how to be. And now I'm not a mom. Alex Sullivan was killed when he was 27 years old on his 27th birthday, and he was killed just two days before celebrating his first wedding anniversary. Alex's father said he suffered for many years from, quote, the Peter Pan syndrome, a refusal to grow up, and that when Alex arrived and he became a father, he said he didn't have to because his son kept him young, essentially. He said, quote, the morning he was murdered, I was forced to grow up. Since then, he added, I've just gotten older. Alexander C. Tevs was 24 years old when he was killed. He had recently graduated from the University of Denver with a master's degree in counseling psychology. He died while at the movie theater with his girlfriend. After he died, his girlfriend legally changed her name to reflect his last name. His mother said, quote, she wanted our blessing and we gave it to her with full hearts. It was meant to be. It's what Alex had wanted. His girlfriend said of her experience at the movie theater and losing Alex, and I quote, I couldn't wake Alex up. I tried and I tried, but I couldn't take him with me. She was then pulled from the theater by a stranger and Alex was left behind with all the others who had died. 
Alex's mother was diagnosed with Parkinson's at around the same time that he was killed. And her biggest fear is that the disease will steal her ability to remember her son's voice. And last, Rebecca Wingo. She was a 32-year-old mother of two girls. She had joined the Air Force out of high school, become fluent in Mandarin, and had even served as a translator. She was married to a man named Robert, who described her as always having the music turned up, as being a big personality who was fearless and fun and the center of everything in their family. She was their comic relief, their lending library, and their soup kitchen. The judge said of all these victims, and I quote, we will never know what they would have accomplished. We will never know the impact they would have made in the world. The defendant robbed not only the friends and families of these victims, he robbed the world of what all of these deceased victims would have accomplished. And with that quote, that my friends is the story of James Holmes and the Aurora, Colorado, Dark Knight Rises mass movie theater shooting. Now I know that is like a ton of information to hear and to process. It's so many victims. It's so much carnage. It was very difficult to look into, um, to make the video. And then, oh my fucking God, reading, there was this one article that just had everything about each of the victims and the statements their family said. And literally reading all of that and learning about them and hearing about them from their family broke my heart into a million pieces. Um, I had some trouble getting through that. Hopefully you won't be able to tell, (laughs) but it just, it was very difficult, especially, especially reading the quotes, um, from the victim's parents. It was just like too much. I can't even imagine what those people went through. It just feels very avoidable, right? Like this guy was clearly suffering from something mentally. There was something not fucking right upstairs and he wasn't shy about talking about it. So it just feels like, I mean, mental health is not prioritized at all. Like it really isn't. And it just seems like if he could have gotten the help he needed when he first started showing symptoms. So when he was super, super young, that maybe we wouldn't be here, you know? And of course there's going to be the subject of gun control. that's going to come up because I do see that talked about a lot with this case. And I totally understand why, because he got all those guns and he was able to get them all legally. Um, And I'm not really going to give my position when it comes to gun control. I've got my thoughts and everything, but I don't want to, everyone gets so pissy and I don't want to deal with it because I'm already upset. (laughs) But if you do feel comfortable um, expressing your opinion, please do so respectfully down below because I am curious what you think when it comes to that in this case. One thing though that I think we can all agree upon is that this was a fucking senseless and pointless tragedy and that these things are getting way too fucking common for comfort these days. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative and it gave you all the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, thank you for remembering all of these victims with me today because what happened to them is so fucking terrible and horrifying and it's the type of thing that could literally happen to any of us at any time in any place. And I think that's what makes it so scary is it's so, it's common now. It happens all the time and it could happen anywhere and it shouldn't. And it's sad and it it just makes me feel, it makes me sad and it makes me wish that we lived in a world where these types of things didn't happen and where mental health, I mean, where physical health was prioritized more um, just in general and where people were kinder and easier and more sympathetic and empathetic with each other. But maybe I'm a dreamer but I'm not the only one. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell because I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, I've got all my social media linked down below. I've got an Instagram, I got a Twitter, I got a Facebook page and a Facebook group. If you want to hang out there, you're more than welcome to do so. I also link all of the makeup on my face down below, the earrings, the nail polish, everything's down there for your convenience, along with a link to my merch store in case you want a shirt or something because you guys wanted some shirts, so I made some shirts. Of course, I want to say one more thank you to Dossier for continuing to sponsor my channel because that's really cool. It's nice to feel so validated by a company that I like so much. And of course, thank you to you guys for always being so supportive because you're so cool, man. It's ridiculous. All of you. All of you. Yes, you specifically. <laughs> and with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.